Hey, a couple things before starting back into physics stuff. Uh, the, just to remind you, the, the last class for the, for the semester is this Friday. It'll be a review. So we have one more day of new material apart from today. Two more days, including today. Um, that's, that's item one. Item two, the final, for this ex, uh, final exam for this class is December 14th in the morning, 9 to 12. It's 60 questions, multiple choice. A way to think about it, the way I try to think about it, is with 60 questions, it's, it's 230 question tests. One of them is the third midterm. So it's material since the second midterm. And the other 30 questions is open season. All right? And there are lots of old exams. And as usual, I encourage you to take them, learn from your mistakes, learn from why, you, the, the, right answer, why the right answer is right, why the wrong answer is wrong, why am I asking you the question at all? Um, what, what's the, what's the, the, the issue in that question? Stuff like that. Uh, the last problem set's due on Wednesday, and it's just about harmonic oscillators. It's not a, individual questions, not, not a long story. Any other things I left out, things you want to hear about? Ah, the, yeah, right, thank you for reminding me. The, the course evaluations. The deal is I drop your lowest problem set score if you complete the course evaluation for this class. And that, that, that evaluation has nothing to do with me directly. It's, it's in a sense, you, you get to grade me. And it's on Colab. It's actually up now. Officially, it's supposed to be, anyway. It, you'd log into Colab and look on the left, left side of the page, uh, the, the left bar, a menu bar. I think it's the last entry in that bar is course evaluations. It, you should be able to go there and complete the course evaluation for all your classes. Um, they may appear at different times. I'm not quite sure when they schedule. This one is, was, went out on the 30th of November at 1 o'clock in the morning, and it's, it, uh, apparently it, it closes uh, late at night on the 12th of De uh, sorry, the 9th of December. So don't go past 11 o'clock and 59 minutes, 59 seconds. That's, again, deadline, not a target. Um, do it early, or, you know, early rather than late. Again, December 9th is the deadline. Any questions? All right. Um, I think that's everything. Okay, other questions? All right. I'll keep this guy open. Ah. Um, so, and if you complete the, the evaluation, I'll drop your, that, that problem set while I'm calculating grades. You will never see any evidence that, that, that anything happened. I, I get a list of who completed the course evaluation, not your individual uh, responses. So I'll, I'll know who did it and who didn't, you know, <laughs> who's been naughty and ni or nice, whatever. Um, and then I'll just wipe out the lowest problem set score, even if it's a zero. All right? So last time um, I was talking about musical instruments, and let me sort of set, uh, set the stage again, or I don't know. The, the, the big picture view of this stuff. Uh, in, the, in the world of clocks, I introduced the idea of, of, of a harmonic oscillator, which is a special kind of oscillator, sort of any oscillator. A generic oscillator is one that has a stable equilibrium, a system that has a stable equilibrium and can basically slosh back and forth or swing back and forth around that stable equilibrium um, before settling down when it runs out of energy, out of extra energy. So we've seen that bouncing motion a whole lot of times in the semester. Uh, a harmonic oscillator is a special case. It's, a, it's a, one of these oscillating systems where the restoring influence that, that, that arises when you leave equilibrium, when the system leaves equilibrium, the restoring influence is proportional to displacement from equilibrium. If you have that, you've got this special kind of, uh, of oscillator known as a harmonic oscillator. And the feature of a harmonic oscillator that's, that's particularly interesting to in many contexts is the time it takes the oscillator to go through one cycle, so it's, it's period, or equivalently, it's frequency, which is one over period, the, the reciprocal of period. It's period or it's frequency doesn't depend on the amplitude of the motion, so how big the cycle is in space or in something equivalent to space. So harmonic oscillators, they show up everywhere, uh, sometimes slightly imperfectly, like the pendulum's not quite a perfect harmonic oscillator. If you swing it too far, you know, it even goes upside down. It goes, it goes bananas if you swing it too far. But as long as you swing it gently, it's so close to a harmonic oscillator that, it, that it's good enough. 
And there are lots of other situations like that. They're almost perfect harmonic oscillators. So you have a period that's almost perfectly independent of, of amplitude. Um, the world is full of things that are close enough. People approximate them routinely as harmonic oscillators because once you've reduced it to a harmonic oscillator, it, 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 identified it as a harmonic oscillator, you have all this machinery that people have developed over the decades and centuries to analyze its behavior. Um, for, for a physicist, if you can look at something and say, you know, that's, that's a, effectively a harmonic oscillator. Um, that's, that's probably equivalent to an engineer being able to look at something and say, that's effectively like a wheel. And we really understand wheels well. Physicists really understand harmonic oscillators well. So this whole section's on harmonic oscillators. And, and the, the chapter. So the, the world of, of, of the harmonic oscillators in clocks are very, are, are essentially very simple ones. They are, they are a single object that goes through a cyclic motion and is the harmonic oscillator, whether it's a, the bob of a pendulum, or it's the little wheel, the rocking wheel in a, in a balance ring clock, or it's the little tuning fork in a, in a quartz watch or quartz clock. Single harmonic oscillator. Okay, so that's setting the stage for the musical instruments. They're typically built around systems that have an extent. It's not a single little object that has it's really like one object, like a ball. It's an extended object that can have, that can, uh, it has an equilibrium, and, but lots of parts of it can, can make, uh, explore places other than equilibrium, and it can have very complicated shapes as a result. So the, the case that I introduced last time is the string of a violin or a guitar or any other stringed instrument. That string is pinched at the two ends, so it can't move. Technically, those, those ends are known as nodes. I'll, I'll never test you on the, the word node, who cares? It's, but the idea that those two, the two ends don't move. And the string in between the two ends can have a very complicated shape if you want it to. It won't have it for very long because it'll move. But, but it, if you take a flash photograph poof, of that string, it can have a crazy shape as long as the ends are both where they're supposed to be. And when you do let it move, it does all kinds of complicated movements. It's a mess. Uh, so it looks like a, a string under tension. I forgot the word of tension. If, you, if you, you're pulling it taut, it's got an equilibrium shape which is straight and that so it so it it's it's looking good it's looking like some oscillating system but if you if you play with it and then let go and then take a flash photograph it can have a really wacky shape it can be it can be it can do this kind of thing from one end to the other it it's just j a jiggly mess and so like how would you ever figure out what it's going to do well it turns out that no matter how complicated that jiggly mess is between the two ends, the two fixed ends, you can think of it as that, that jiggly shape is consisting of a bunch of simple shapes stacked on top of each other, um, added together. Mathematically, this, is, this lives in the land of what, what are known as Fourier series and stuff like that. If you ever encountered that, you can, you can make an arbitrary function of, of, of position like if this is x, you can take an arbitrary function of x and you can write that function as the sum of sine waves and the details of how the sine waves work. And you, know, you, have, to, you have to choose how, how large, the amplitude of each sine wave, but you put them all together, you can make any kind of crazy function assembled out of sine waves. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, sorry, just set it aside. But the same shows up in, in, a, in a vibrating string you can take any crazy shape of the string and assemble it by adding together sine waves, which are the, which will, which are the interesting shapes, the sine, to, to get, it, get that crazy shape. And each of those sine waves you're adding together is, is an interesting structure. It is, a, it is one of the modes of vibration of the string. So what's a mode of vibration? It's if you, Okay, you've got the, cra the crazy shape as a possibility, but, but can we just like set aside all the details and, and look for the simplest shape that you could possibly make? Well, the simplest shape for a string, for, for it being distorted away from equilibrium, the simplest shape is, is, it, is a smooth, single smooth arc, the smooth arc of a jump rope, um, for example, and it turns out that shape is a, it, it is a sine function. It is a trigonometric sine function. If it, it doesn't make sense to you, doesn't matter, it's an arc, single arc. And that single arc, when the string is, is, do, is, is 
moving and that's is uh, vibrating with that single arc as its as its basic structure it has a very simple behavior the whole string has th this uh, first of all it's it's going to vibrate about the the equilibrium which is straight that's imposed by the by the tension in the string it wants to be straight that's the that's that's where it will settle if you just let the energy dribble out of it but as it's vibrating in the single arc up and down about that equilibrium <laughs> Every time it leaves the equilibrium, it develops restoring influences across its entire structure. The whole structure is experiencing influences, and they're, overall, all those influences individually are together proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. It is a single weird harmonic oscillator, or it behaves as a harmonic oscillator. So despite having this, this extent from, from maybe this hand to that, that hand, that whole extent, that big structure and that big arc and everything, and it could be all wacky in shape. It, it isn't. It's a simple shape. And it behaves a harmonic oscillator when it's in that shape. And the harmonic oscillator has a, a very well-defined period and that depends on, 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 not on amplitude. Whether, whether the thing's going up and down a little or a lot, it doesn't matter because it's a harmonic oscillator. All right? And when you pluck the string of a, of a violin or a guitar or, any, or a harp, pretty much any stringed instrument you have, um, you will, most of the motion, the, pr the, the primary motion that you'll get is that fundamental mo mo movement, the, what's the fundamental vibrational mode, the single arc. Uh, the string can vibrate in other more complicated uh, structures. I mean, the big messy one, yes, it can do that, but that's really just the sum of a lot of little simple ones. And the other simple ones are, so you got the fundamental, the two half strings, which is the, what's called the second harmonic, and it goes through its motion twice as fast, twice, I should say, uh, twice as fast in time as the other. That is, its period is half, is half the, the, the period of the fundamental, or equivalently, its frequency is twice the frequency of the fundamental. So the two half strings is, uh, is the second harmonic mode of the string, the simple, the, 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 the second of the, a simple way in which the string can vibrate. And it has a very, it has a single frequency, specific frequency, twice the frequency of the fundamental. The three one-third strings, another simple mode, it's the third harmonic, and it vibrates at, its frequency is three times the fundamental, and so on. They're called harmonics because of this integer relationship between frequencies. And that's true of strings, it's true of, of uh, the columns of air and wind instruments. Uh, it is not true of the, of the head of a drum. A drum does not have harmonic um, mo modes. It has a fundamental drum, as we'll see, well, as I'll say, I can say now that a drum can vibrate up and down about a stable equilibrium. It is another harmonic oscillator. Uh, it can be harmonic oscillators again. The simplest, its simplest movement is the middle of the drum coming up and then going through the equilibrium and then going down and then going through equilibrium and up. And down. That's the simplest mode for the head of a drum vibrating. And it is another harmonic oscillator. And so it has a, p a frequency that doesn't depend on how loud your, uh, the volume of the drum, uh, the loudness of the drum. And so that, that's the fundamental. The, the other ways in which the drum head can vibrate aren't harmonic modes because they're not integer multiples in frequency of the fundamental. They're messy. They're all over the place. They, they use. The, the math to calculate what their, what their frequencies are is messy. So they're not called, harmonics are called just generic overtones. Higher, they're higher in frequency, but, but hard to predict. Yeah, David? Uh, for the vibration of a drum, does, does it stop vibrating faster because it has stronger restoring forces? Does, does a drum stop, stop, oh, stop vibrating faster because of stronger restoring forces? Actually, it's, it's not the restoring forces that stop a drum from vibrating. If you took the, the drum into space where there's no air and got it to go up and down, it would go up and down a lot, in a long time. The problem that, that a drum has is that it pushes really well on the air. And so the air just sucks the energy out of it in a, in a couple of vibrations. This, this mode, this up and down pumping mode, woo, 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 gone. It just, it's, it, it's, it's, it's sending the energy out as sound uh, very effectively and uh, probably also making heat too. So it, it just wastes the energy too fast. Is that okay? 
that actually that brings me to an interesting thing that I, that I that, you know, so thank you for reminding me of an important point here is that the strings vibrate, as I, as I described. I hope, I hope it's making some, why does this guy keep turning himself off? Ah, it would help to plug it in. All right, one second. All right. Um, is string vibrating back and forth? I, I hope that it's, that it's clear that the string can vibrate in crazy shapes, but it's, it's simple. You can always describe any crazy shape as the sum of the simple shapes. And the simple shapes are the vibrational modes, each of which has its own frequency. And those frequencies are all multiples of the fundamental frequency. So, questions about that, that idea? So when you're playing a violin, playing a guitar, or whatever, you're, you're, you're typically uh, the string is, has, has, a, has a set of frequencies that it's working with, and the vibrations are there in the string. So how do you hear it? And so let me, let me, let me go and, and deal with, with sound and with the product, projection of sound. On a, and, I'll, and I'm going to take the long story, Here, the, 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 starting with the string itself. The string itself is, has nodes at the end. They're, they're enforced. That is, most places that don't move at the end, they're enforced by the instrument. You can't, the end of the guitar string, the end of the violin string, they're both pinned down. And so the string can vibrate back and forth, but those nodes stay, stay put at the ends. The string dances up and down in place, basically. And that dancing shape up and down, I showed you them last, last time, it sure looks like a wave. And it is a wave. It's, it's identified by physicists as a standing wave, a wave that doesn't go anywhere, that dances in place. And in particular, the nodes don't move. The nodes just stay put. And similarly, the, the antinode, which is the place of maximum excursion of some sort, uh, also doesn't move. It just dances in place. So standing waves are the classic, fun, they're, they're the basic modes of vibration or oscillation of a limited, but an extended, but limited object. So a string is an extended object, meaning it's got, it's got, a, it's got a size, but it's not forever. It ends. So that's the limited. So limited objects have vibrational modes, typically have vibrational modes that are standing waves. Is that okay? What if you don't have ends? If it just goes on forever, the, 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 most, the simplest of the way to think of the modes then, and they're po it's possible, are not standing waves but traveling waves, where the nodes and the antinodes actually move through space. And sound is a case of that. So we'll see in a moment with the wind instruments that, that when, a wind, when I play a, a, a recorder, you know, what's vibrating in that? It's actually the column of air between the, the top here and the bottom there. There's a column of air inside this thing that is vibrating, and I'll talk about the details shortly. But again, it's limited. Um, the, I, should, I do want to put in a little bit of the, the details. The, the vibration of that column of air is about another equilibrium, as it always has to be. What's the equilibrium? It's the air distributed uniformly through the, through the pipe. Uh, the pressure and density are the same everywhere. That's equilibrium. That's, you know, air loves to, if, if there's a difference in pressure between here and here, the air is going to accelerate towards low pressure and undo that, that difference. So air loves to settle down at uniform pressure and density. Um, we're messing that up inside that, that instrument. That's, that's how it's making the, the vibration. And we're, we're making regions of high pressure and high density. They go together. I mean, we're assuming it's a constant temperature. As the, as, the, as the density goes up, the pressure goes up. And, I, and I'll, just because it comes out of my mouth, I'll, I'll talk about both of them, but they're going together. And so the pressure goes up, and then it goes down, and then it goes up and down, about equilibrium. And the density at the same time is going from high, higher density compressed air to rarefied air, which is, which is less than normal density, to compress, to rarefied, to compress, to rarefied up and down, inside the pipe. Well, if we get rid of the pipe, you can still get those excursions up and down about, about the atmospheric pressure. But they, but they don't sit still anymore. They travel. 
So they become traveling waves in the open air, which is an extended me medium with no ends. At least sort of, you can sort of think of it as endless. And so the waves travel. And so what I'm, when, when I'm talking here and you're listening out there, what, I, what I'm doing is I am alternately compressing the air to higher density, rarefying it to, to lower density, up and down and up and down. Those excursions in pressure and density travel. They become traveling waves. They whiz across through space. And you're hearing them as they pass your ears or enter your ears. All right? So that's sound in air. Sound can travel in, in any material. It can travel in solids. It has slightly different characteristics when it travels in solids. It typically goes much faster than in air. But it's, it's another one of these compression rarefaction. Uh, most, most of sound in solids and in liquids is, is, is similar to that in air. OK, so a wind instrument can, can pretty naturally create those traveling waves because it, it ends, but it's not sealed. And so that, that you get the funny pressure excursions and stuff inside, but they're kind of related to the pressure excursions that can occur outside. And, and so there, there's some leakage from one to the other, and you end up with sound naturally coming out of wind instruments. With stringed instruments, which is the point where I'm going, I'm giving you the long story. Stringed instruments, there's not such a natural connection between the, the motion of the string, this lovely vibrational motion of the string, and these pressure density excursions in the air that travel along a sound. They're not necessarily connected. And if you've ever played a, an electric guitar played with an electric guitar that's not plugged into anything, it's pretty quiet. You can't hear much. Why not? It's because there's really nothing in the electric guitar that is unplugged to, to project sound out. It's got the vibration going on in the string, but that doesn't mean sound's going to happen. So it's called an electric guitar because it uses a completely different mechanism to create the sound. The sound comes out of the speaker more than it comes out of the guitar. So what's the problem? And I, and I mentioned this a little last time. The problem is when a string vibrates up and down rhythmically, even, even though the frequency at which it's moving is right, is right to be a tone that's, that, that, we, that, that, that you know and love, it's terrible at projecting sound. As the string goes, moves through the air up and down, the air just scoots around it. It's the, the string is so skinny that rather than compressing the air to high density or rarefying it to low density, it just, the air just goes around and stays at, at atmospheric density and, and laughs at the string as it goes by. Ha ha, you know, miss me. So strings are terrible at, at, at projecting sound. And this is true of all the string instruments, including pianos. If you, if you remove. If you just had a piano that was just the strings and, these, and, a, and the frame that, that applies tension to them uh, and the hammers that play them, it would be a very quiet instrument. You need some help to project sound from a string. And the, the, the help comes from surfaces. Surfaces are much better at projecting sound than our strings. I, I told you last time a little bit about the same idea with the tuning forks. They're, they're not that much bigger in dimensions that, than, a, than a string. And so as I get this guy going, my classic way of getting him going, is, is whack, you know, I've whacked it. It's, it's moving so much that, that they, appear, they appear fuzzy to my eyes. As see these guys go back and forth. But they're not very loud. You can hear it a little. Um, the problem is the air just scoots around it each time it tries to move. So to get more sound, you need surfaces to get involved, because air can't go around surfaces so easily. Uh, this explains some of the, the, need, the need for structure in speakers. Speakers, audio speakers, have the same problem. If they were just a uh, little object going back and forth, driven by your, your music, the air would scoot around them and not make much sound. There, the audio engineers are trying always to, to make it so that the air, the, the, the whatever's moving inside the speaker, manages to compress and rarefy the air uh, rhythmically, following the music. Um, the technology behind that is, is challenging and, and complicated. Um, so th this, this thing, for example, is much better at projecting sound. Most of the sound that you're hearing isn't coming from the tuning fork. It's coming from the box. All right? And another way to show you this is, is so here's a, 
music box. I don't know whether you've ever, you ever take the, you know, you get a gift, whatever, it's got a little music box inside, you take it apart. This is the kind of thing that's hiding inside. And this is how they come when you buy them, just independently of, of some thing with a ballerina twisting around. If you tear the thing apart and get it down to just the frame, and, and what, what this has is a comb, I guess, can I do this? I guess I can. It's got a comb of, ha ha. Yay. I'm looking at it. Who knows what? All right. Zoom in. I'm looking at a, at, at a video of a video of a video. It's pretty silly. OK. Um, so, so, oh, focus. There. This, a music box has a little roll that turns with little pins on it that, that have the music have, the, have the, the tune embedded as pins in its surface. So as that, little, as that drum up there in the top left turns, it plucks little, the little tines of, a, of a, the, this comb over here. That, that's little harmonic oscillators. Each one of them is a harmonic oscillator. I would say, a, say one harmonic oscillator, but because they are extended objects, they actually can vibrate in more than one mode. But their fundamental mode is, is chosen to be the right pitch. Uh, to be the, the Western scale. And so this is, you know, hi-ho, we're listening to, we're listening to the, the people going off to work, hi-ho, hi-ho, <laughs> off to where we go, right? And the music that you're hearing, if you're hearing it, is not coming from those little teeth of the comb. If I lift this guy off the, off the glass, it becomes silent, or nearly silent. The sound is coming from this glass surface here, or the plastic surface. Surface is critical to a music box, like everything else. Um, that pr moves up and down in rhythm with the, the teeth. They're, they're, they're just mechanically coupled to one another enough that as, that, as, the, as the, one of the teeth vibrates back, a tooth vibrates back and forth, it jiggles the entire piece of, of glass plastic and projects the sound. Is that okay? All right, I won't wind it anymore. It'll play the rest of the class, which is a nuisance. All right. Any other questions about projecting sound? Yeah, any other tidbits? Yeah, a piano, for example, has a soundboard, just to tell you that. Um, on, on a grand piano, it lies under the strings. On a upright piano, it's, it's the back of the piano, typically protected by something. It's quite thin. Carefully, in principle, it should be very carefully made single piece of, of wood, although it's maybe assembled uh, gluing sheets together. But if it, if it breaks or something like that, you, you lose a lot of the uh, projection that the piano has. Uh, if you get rid of that, that board, think, well, you know, who needs this? The piano will become almost silent. All right? I think that's the whole story for stringed instruments, best I, you know, good enough. Any questions about stringed instruments? Okay, um, wind instruments, a little, little story about that. As I've sort of already said and said in the, in the lecture video, so in a wind instrument, what is vibrating is the air. It's not the physical instrument. So you could put your hands all over the physical instrument, which, which would be a problem if, if the instrument were vibrating. Touching it messes it up, just like touching a violin string as it's vibrating or, or a guitar string. Is it you mess it up. You change its ability to vibrate. Or you typically you suck energy out of it. You mess up its vibrational modes. You don't want to touch it. Um, the wind instruments, and the, this includes the brass instruments and a variety of other things that are technically involved, the, the air vibrating. What's, what's vibrating is the air inside the protected environment of the instrument. So a, the simplest possible wind instrument, I guess essentially the simplest, ah, is just a, a pipe. So for example, a straw. This is, this is a you know, ultra simple wind instrument. It's open at both ends, but it's a protected environment in which the air pressure and density can go above and below the average, the ambient 
atmospheric pressure density. And to get that to happen, I have to somehow sort of kick it into action. And I could do it just by pressurizing the ends and, and popping off, I guess, that would do it. But the simplest approach is to blow across the lip. The lip. Do you hear a tone? It's, it's breathy, but it, I'm not going to imitate it. You're sort of OK with it, that? If I shorten, ooh, do I have scissors? Of course not. Plan ahead. Ah, I should have scissors. The pitch would go up as I did this. Um, oh well, plan ahead didn't. I can make it longer. If I make, well, at first I should tell you what the, the, this thing also has vibrational modes. And the fundamental vibrational mode, the simplest mode it can have, is the pressure going up and down rhythmically where my fingers are, in the middle of the pipe. So the, the, the full cycle of, of behavior in this, in this pipe is air rushes in both ends and piles up in the middle. This is the first quarter of a cycle. Piles up in the middle to high pressure and density. The next quarter cycle is nature abhors that arrangement. High pressure in the middle, low pressure outside, uh-uh. It accelerates and it begins to flow out of the ends. And as it does, so the, so the air is actually rushing out of the, both ends, opposite directions, and the pressure momentarily reaches the, the uh, average, normal atmospheric pressure. That's equilibrium. So it's momentarily at equilibrium, but it's moving, and it coasts right through. So at the end of the second quarter cycle, the air is at equilibrium, but it's got so much movement, it flows beyond that. And it goes too much, and it creates a partial vacuum, a low pressure and density in the middle. That's the end of the third cycle, third quarter cycle. You've got lower than atmospheric pressure in the middle, and the fourth quarter cycle is the air rushes back in and uh, you get back to equilibrium again, but coasts right through it. So the, so the air pressure in the middle is going above atmospheric to atmospheric again, below atmospheric to atmospheric again, above, below, above, below, rhythmically up and down. Is that okay? And at the same time, the air is rushing in and out of the ends. And that's what's happening when I'm doing this. You know, how, why is blowing across it? Interesting. What it's doing is, my blowing across it is kind of like bowing a violin string. I'm rhythmically adding energy to that bouncing motion of air in, air out, air in, air out. And the way that works is by blowing across that surface, I manage, the, the air is, my, my wind is influenced by what's happening at the end. As air is flowing out of the end, my air gets blown out also. As air is flowing in to the end, my air is blown into the end also and joins it. It adds energy to it. So it, it's rhythmically pumping more energy into the motion. And this, this is, this is the, old, the oldest of flutes was like this. You just blew across the end. It didn't have fancy mouthpieces and stuff like that. Um, you are also familiar to, with a motion like this when, when you are an effect like this in a whistle. So, so a recorder has a, a whistle structure here, which is it's the same as, in, as on a like, athletic whistle. Uh, it's, it's a fancy way of making sure you blow right across the right opening that, so that your air either is, goes out when the air is going out the hole or goes in when the air is going in and you manage to add energy to the motion. You're rhythmically adding energy. Is that okay? Pipe organs have the same structure. Look at them. Watch them. They're blowing air. They're blowing air into that knife edge, which, which allows the air in and out of the, moving in and out of the hole to uh, be, be, have energy added to it. Work done on it, thrown in and out and in and out. Um, the last example that I, this should be familiar, you're driving down the road and in a car with all the windows closed and one person opens one window. You know this effect? <laughs> you know, you hear you do, whoa, 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 in, your, in your ears? You know that one? That's the car acting as a whistle. It's, it's, it's a wind instrument, again. And as air is flowing out the window, the air blowing across it um, joins that air going out. And as air goes into the window during, during the oscillating cycle, 
as air goes into the window during the outside, like the air being blown across it goes into the, into the car. So it's basically, you're, it's a giant whistle. You're, you're, you're driving around in a, in a huge, instead of the, like the coach going tweet, tweet, tweet up there, it's tweet, tweet, tweet down there. So low frequency, it doesn't, it, you don't hear it as music or tone, it, but it hurts your ears. And a solution is to open the, the opposite window. I was, let's see, okay, I was, I was on track to make, to lower the pitch. There's that pitch, and if I put another straw on the end, typical thing to do as a kid to make the world's longest straw, we went down an octave, went a factor of two in pitch, in frequency. I'm not doing a very good job. Okay? Um, more wind instruments played the same way. Right? Yeah, of course, this one, of course, I can, I can play with the pitch. Um, this, incidentally, is not open at both ends. So its fundamental mode is a little different. And, and I should, let me, let me show you this effect first before I do that. It's closed at the far end. So the fundamental mode of an open, open pipe like this is the middle going up and down in pressure. The fundamental mode of a, of a tube that is open at one end, closed at the other end, is, one, is the closed end going up and down in pressure. And the pitch is twice, is, is half, it's half the frequency. Can you hear that? I, I, no. So when I close that end, the, 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 it's this end that has the up and down excursion and pressure. No air can go in there. So that's, that's the, the simplest way in which this could vibrate is for the air pressure at the closed end to make the excursion up and down. So it, it resembles a pipe that's twice as long. If the pipes were twice as long and open at both ends, the middle where my fingers are would go up and down in pressure. But I take away one half and I seal it here, I get the same effect. The pitch is the same as it was. All right? So having done that then, these bottles, when I, when I play a bottle, the pressure, the, the air pressure and density are, are making the, the excursions up and down here. So that's where the air is blow, blowing across. This is the excursion. If this were a car, and it was driving along. This is the passenger side over here where the person opens the window and you're driving over here. The driver is the one that feels the pressure's going up and down like crazy. The person over there that opened the window is got like, is there a problem? I don't feel a problem. And you're going like, ah, this hurts my ears. Okay, because you're in the place where the pressure's making major excursions. I hope that makes sense. All right. So. <laughs> As I shorten the tube, the pitch comes up. All right. Can't go how I can go. All right. Um, so you can tune these guys. I, now I should say, like, where are the pitches coming from in any of this stuff? Let me remind you with the string. The pitch came about through, through a battle between an inertial thing and a re restoring force, restoring influence. And in the string, the, doing its fundamental mode of vibration, the inertial thing is the mass of that string. So, so you take the string, cut it off, go in, and uh, you can weigh it, but that involves weight, not mass. You shake it, okay, how much mass is here? Oh, one-tenth of a kilogram or a hundredth of a kilogram or something. Okay, so that's the inertial part. The more mass you have in the string, the slower it goes through its motion because the more inertia it has, the more it, it, the harder it is to, to, to get it to go one way first and then back and then the other way and so on. So the mass of the string matters. The tension in the string matters. The tighter the string is, the faster, the stiffer the restoring force becomes and the faster it goes through its motion. And lastly, the length of the string matters. The shorter the string is, both the less mass it has and the stiffer the restoring force becomes. The, the more fiercely it fights small distortions 
from the center. So that's how you ultimately choose the, the, the pitch of a string is you, you choose the mass of the string, you choose the tension of the string, you choose the length of the string. And those work together to give you the pitch. With a column of air, the mass is basically the mass of the air. And the stiffness, the restoring force, the restoring influence is, um, comes about where it's, the, it's affected by the length of the column. The longer the column is, the, the wimpier the restoring force becomes. As, as the column becomes very short, it, it really fights excursions in pressure uh, about equilibrium. Um, so a short column has a very stiff restoring force and also a small mass. And is there anything else in it? The mass of the column, the length of the column. I think that does it. So as I'm, I'm shortening the column inside this by, by adding water, the pitch goes up. The other thing I can do to affect the frequency in, in, this, in this, now that it's got a certain length, I, the length is fixed, I've gotten rid of all the water, can I, can I change the pitch? And I can. If I change the density of the gas inside here, then it will still be the atmospheric pressure, it'll still do the excursions about atmospheric pressure, but the mass involved will be less or more, depending on what kind of gas I use. So if I replace the air that's in this with a low mass gas like helium, Can I check and make sure it's helium? Yep, it's helium. Hello, hello. <sighs> okay, so. I need to do it upside down so I don't lose the helium very fast. Not very effective. Let me try again. Can you hear the pitch at all? I'm a bad flautist. Let's try this again. Come on. You could hear it swoop? Because while there was helium in there, the, the motion was much faster. It was e much easier to get it coming come and go. And actually, related to this is, you know, why, why does my voice go nuts? It's because when, when you breathe in helium, and you're, so there's all helium, sound travels faster in helium. The mass is so much less that all the motions go, are, are faster. And so it affects the whole vocal resonances, all the vocal resonances. So those of you who are in speech pathology, if somebody can't hit the high notes, just let them breathe some helium. <laughs> all right. OK? Other things relating to the vibrations of column air. So, so um, the fundamental mode I told you about, there are harmonics as well. The column of air in a, in a uniform uh, pipe has nice, simple harmonics. That is, it's got a second harmonic where, where the, the, air, the air in the tube has two places in which the pressure goes ab up above and below atmospheric pressure uh, maximally. Two antinodes, one here and one here. The middle is another node. That's the second harmonic. The third harmonic is three, is, is three places of maximum excursion and two extra nodes, and so on. Um, once, once you start changing the shape of the, of the instrument's pipe, then you can get non-harmonic overtones, and so they sound more complicated. Um, OK, I can show you, I forget which one of these guys works best. So this is an open, open tube. And, and when, I, when I'm talking about an open, open tube, I'm just, it becomes jargon after a while. But the, the two classic types of tube are open, open at both ends, so air can rush in and out of both of them, and the fundamental nodes uh, has, a ma has an antinode of, of pressure right here, maximum excursion here. If it's closed at one end, then it's a closed open tube. It's different, and they're, they're, most instruments are open, open. There probably are some, but I can't even think of any open, closed, in which case the, the maximum excursion pressure and density is here. Anyway, open, open, OK? And I claim it has a fundamental mode, and it also has harmonics. And how would you ever get them to go? Well, I can't blow across it enough to make it go, but I can swing it. I'm having trouble getting the fundamental.
This is, yeah, it's too, it's too wacky. I can't, I can't do it. Let's try this way. I think that's the harmonic. <laughs> the, the point of this is, as you swing it, you can get the different modes. And the fundamental, that's the fundamental. That's the second harmonic. That's third harmonic. Okay? And a bugle operates this way. A bugle has no, con you have no control over the length of the pipe, no, no valves. It's just a pipe. And to get the different tones, you have to get the different harmonics. And it takes you know, some, some considerable skill on the part of the bugler to go back and forth between this and you know, these various modes. Is that okay? Last fun and games is to get column of air vibrating in a, in a pipe like this, I can't swing it anymore. So there, it, there turns out there's a trick for doing this. A burner can get those, can, can, can power those mo mo movements. So if I put this over the burner, Not getting much here. Okay, I can't get that one to go. Let me try a longer one. There we go. So that's the fundamental mode of this guy. And now, get out of the way, bucko. All right, this guy's even longer. Good. All right, and one more it takes out the screen. This, this, I'll tell you, is a cheat. This is just a, a metal pipe, and that looks like, well, it should just be a, a, a pitch somewhat higher than those guys. But it's got, it's got some, hot, some metal gauze inside that I can heat up. And it turns out it's not the flame that's important. It's the, it's the, it's the convection current that comes. So it goes a little. is now providing the heat source once I heat the gauze up. So let me heat the gauze. Okay. Oh, I turned out the burner. Where's the spark starter? All right. Heat the gauze up again. Couldn't do it. All right, one more time, and then I call it day. So if you need a really weird musical instrument for your production, you know, here you go. All right, with that then, I'll, I'll stop on musical instruments, and uh, we'll do the C and stuff on Wednesday.